Hey, what's good, man? It's your boy JFC Capo, man. Smash that like and sub button, man. Bring you a video about the cartel right now, man. About today. About to see what's up with this. Hey, shout out to the fugitive. This man saw 300 bodies in acid. You feel me? It's a cartel member. Want to know who they talking about. Sound like be El Chapo or one of them dudes, man. I don't know. Let's find out. Hit this play button. The army rained holy hell on his hideout. And as they whisked him away, the soldier would later recall that he turned and threatened him, saying, you have no idea who you're messing with. But they did. He was Santiago Meza Lopez, one of the most mysterious and important figures in the narcotics underworld. He was so important that just a few days after his capture, an armed faction of cartel hitmen well, say, but that, no, that's not El to break him out of his cell. Now, if you're wondering why cartel members would bother to break out a man who was dumb enough to get captured, well, it was because Santiago was the legendary El Pozolero, the stew maker, the man who had mastered the art of making bodies disappear. To understand how a man like Santiago became El Pozolero, to understand what a stew maker is and why that role was so important to the cartels, first, we need some context. And that context... I know, bro, is not, yo. Know. I know you're not making like human stew, like beef stew, like bro. Oh, hell no. Nah. We got another Jeffrey Dahmer on the damn man, on our hands, man. Spanish Dahmer. All right, the Mexican Jeffrey. Form of the event that followed the fall of the Guadalajara yeah. cartel. In the late 80s, this man, Miguel Felix Gallardo, was arrested, and it caused his cartel to split into three different factions. One such faction was the incredibly notorious Arellano Felix cartel, that was controlled by the equally notorious Arellano brothers, Benjamin Arellano Felix and Ramon Arellano Felix. This dynamic pair controlled significant trading routes. Yeah, take off my damn boots and shit. California, trading me. routes that the Sinaloa cartel also wanted. Fuck with these shit, seven. Start getting cold outside. In an age of violence, Gotta keep you up there. Had seen before. From kidnappings to assassinations and every assault you can imagine, people were dying by the thousands, mostly uh -huh. innocent people. And the cartels had dumped their bodies on the water point. Uh, uh, on the water proof joints too. Bridges. It was an eyesore until one day the bodies stopped. For the casual so observer, I'm just gonna always look thing, nice. No, it's not scuff them bitches up. Fewer victims, right? Wrong. People were still going missing. An average of 30,000 people went missing every year from 1996 to the late 2000s from cartel-related yeah. violence. And as the missing persons cases piled up, Again. authorities found themselves confronted by a question they had no answer for. Where were all the bodies? Santiago Meza Lopez. Santiago Meza Lopez was born in Sinaloa, Mexico in 1964. Like many Sinaloans at the time, Santiago was born into poverty. Man, and to make matters worse, he had nine siblings. This tough reality forced Santiago oh, yeah, to nah. become independent from a very young age. By the time he was an adult, Santiago had established himself as a mason. And he was so good at his job that sometime in the late 80s, he caught the attention of members of the newly formed Arejano Felix organization. At first, he did some masonry work for them. Then, he took on more work, tending to their horses. Two things that stood out for Santiago at the time was his foot soldier mentality and his incredible work ethic. He was loyal, dedicated, and carried out his work with such efficiency that his bosses began to realize that he would be useful for more than just tending horses. So, they decided to bring him into the fold, and he became a drug dealer for the Ariano Felix organization. Mm. Soon enough, he was promoted to drug office keeper, supervising drug cartel depots within Tijuana that belonged to the cartel. This was an incredibly dangerous job, but somehow Santiago managed to keep both his head and his job. During this period, the conflict between Ariano Felix and their rivals, the Sinaloa cartel, had reached a fever pitch. A few thousand people were killed in the span of a few months, and their mm. bodies were scattered all over the city. This level of violence put the Mexican army and police on high alert, and it attracted the attention of American law enforcement like the DEA and FBI. The cartels began to realize the urgency of their situation. If they couldn't find an efficient method of disposing of the bodies, those same bodies would lead a trail back to them and would result in their capture. So, in 1996, the Arellano brothers sought professional advice from mysterious foreign criminals who had experience in making bodies disappear. Their advice was diabolically simple. Instead of throwing bodies away, turn the flesh to paste and grind the bones to dust. This Hollywood horror-inspired method of body disposal struck a chord with the Arellano brothers. It was ingenious, cost-effective, 
and would leave no DNA evidence that could be traced back to them. The only problem was trust. They needed someone they could trust with this simple yet sickening task, because on one hand, it was going to be a long-term gig, and on the other, there was a heaping pile of bodies begging to be disposed of. The Ariano brothers assigned drug lords Efrain Perez and Jorge Aureliano Felix with the task of finding someone suitable, and the obvious choice at the time was Santiago Meza Lopez. So they arranged a little experiment with the man, call it their own Manhattan Project. Santiago was invited into a room that had a 200 liter cylindrical drum filled with a corrosive solution of caustic soda mixed in water and a couple of other chemicals. Then Santiago was ordered to drop a huge chunk of regular meat into the solution and stir it until it had completely dissolved. Now, I can't tell you what was going through Santiago's head as he conducted the bizarre experiment, but I'm sure it was fairly self-explanatory, because six months later, Santiago was called for a second experiment. The conditions were the same, except for two things. One, there was an audience, henchmen, who would learn and work closely with Santiago. Two, instead of a chunk of meat, the subject of their experiment was a dead victim. Santiago was instructed to undress the victim and cram the body into the 200 liter barrel of the corrosive solution. They all watched as the liquid frothed and turned red. Then they left the body in the liquid overnight. By the time they returned the next morning, what was left of the corpse was a gooey mess of organic sludge with some bone fragments sticking out. It had worked. Work began almost immediately. Over the next three months, Santiago became head of this disposal division and was placed on a $600 a week retainer. This was his payment for making human beings disappear. When business- Hell nah, $600 a week? You bugging, what the fuck is this? Nigga, a job at motherfucking Applebee's or something? Are you crazy? Motherfuckers bugging, bro. Ain't no way. Can't pay me six hundred dollars to dispose no bodies. Uh, fuck that, nigga. Shit. They want forty-five million for a whole body. Nigga, if I'm disposing a whole body, nigga, I need at least five hundred racks. You bugging? You tweaking, nigga? I need at least two fifty, two hundred fifty thousand each motherfucking body. You ain't no way. Hell no. Nah. Santiago got upwards of 30 bodies per month, and those bodies were delivered at predetermined location where either by a call or the flash of headlights, he would know the exact spot to pick the corpses he would dispose of. Santiago always- Dang. And then, comparing Mexican dollars to US dollars, bro, these niggas is getting killed for nothing. These niggas getting killed for cents, like literally. Like, bro getting killed for like 50 bucks. Oh, it's crazy. Mm. That he had the solution in excess. He invested a lot into oil barrels, bought enough latex gloves to last. <laughs> Let me not go to motherfucking Mexico. Shit. I be dropping hits on everybody left to right. On $10 here, $40 there, $100 here, $75 there. Nigga, why be getting niggas gone, boy? and would also stuck up on gas masks that protected himself and his crew from the terrible fumes and stench that came from the liquefying bodies. The stewing body often took about eight hours to dissolve, and what was often left behind was bone fragments, teeth, and nails, which Santiago would then burn and bury in fields. This is where Santiago earned the nickname El Pozolero. El Pozolero translates to someone who makes pozole. Pozole is a Mexican stew made from hominy and meat, with other ingredients for garnishing. The process of stirring the bodies in this mixture looks and feels a lot like stirring a pot of pozole on fire. The barrels of liquefied humans were collected by pickup trucks under the cover of night and tossed down cliffs and canyons where no one would imagine searching. However, as Santiago gained more experience in this macabre trade, he created a more efficient drainage system because the remains were too heavy to move. Santiago was dutiful. The very fact that he lived long enough to get arrested proves that he never gave his bosses any reason to complain. At some point during this macabre routine, Santiago began to work directly for the utterly ruthless Teodoro Garcia Cimental, who went by the alias El Teo and worked for the Ariano Felix organization. El Teo's specialty was extortion and kidnapping, and most of his kidnapped victims often ended up in Santiago's barrels, so it made sense that Santiago answered to him. However, in 2008, more than 12 years after Santiago first started liquefying bodies for the Ariano brothers, El Teo had a huge fallout with the organization and switched sides to the Sinaloa cartel. The master kidnapper began to work for El Chapo and he took Santiago along with him. Now Santiago was the chief stew maker for the Sinaloa cartel. This I meant knew it. See, I know it was somewhere he was going to Sinaloa. He worked for and with. It was a classic case of loyalty to the dollar and 
nothing else. How he got caught. For almost a decade, authorities had no idea who El Pozo was. Then, in 2005, Imagine you seeing this dude, you with him, he doing all of this, bro. And now he doing the shit to y'all. <laughs> See you. That's crazy. Those working under El Teo were captured and questioned. They admitted to kidnapping and killing three people before handing them over to a head of a cleanup crew named El Pozolero. Their testimony and detailed descriptions of Santiago helped oh, the government man. uncover the stewmaker's identity, and he became a high priority target in several countries. Eventually, he was placed as number 20 on the FBI's list of most wanted men. However, Santiago managed to evade the feds for four years until he slipped up in 2009. Santiago, El Teo, and other members of the crew were partying in the Baja Seasons neighborhood, playing loud music with sex workers, when someone in the vicinity tipped the police and informed them of the identity of the noisy neighbors. The police immediately informed the Mexican army. However, before the soldiers could capture the squad, someone alerted Alteo and he fled with 30 of his men. But Santiago was too drunk and too busy cooking seafood to notice his comrades fleeing. Santiago. Nah, they ran on him on purpose, man. They probably was like, well, we leave, bro. They probably won't even come for us no more. They probably just want him. You feel me? And that's exactly what happened, like, for the moment. I don't know if anything else happened after that, but yeah. That's what it seemed like, what happened. On the 25th of January, he confessed to investigators that he had liquefied over 300 victims. Damn. When he was paraded in public, he broke down and wept, begging God for forgiveness and apologizing to the families of the victims he had stewed. According to him, he wasn't a monster. He wasn't a killer or even a drug dealer. He was just a man doing a job. It's his food job. On the table. But that was his violent. job. On one hand, the family of his victims revealed that Santiago had refused to cooperate with the police and refused to reveal the locations of the victims he liquefied. To put it simply, he refused to snitch. They, they was already dead, you know what I'm saying? So it's look. 300 victims. Obviously, that was a lie. And the reason it was a lie was because of a place called the Chicken Coop. The Chicken Coop was an area in the city of Maclovio Rojas, Baja, Mexico, where Santiago installed a drainage and poured his stewed victims. It was basically a graveyard for liquid people. In his own words, it was the devil to move them, the human remains, because they weighed a lot. After everything was cleaned up, we stored the barrels. We also washed the drain with hot water because the remains stuck to the pipes. Santiago used that location for at least a year and a half until the Mexican army raided the place. However, they didn't find anything because they didn't know what to look for. In August 2017, three new graves were found with at least 7,000 human fragments and 2,000 teeth. And this was what confirmed the fears of the authorities. Santiago's body count was not 300, it was in the tens of thousands. Later on, at least 14 to 15,000 fragments of remains were subsequently found in another area that Santiago used called La Gallera. In 2012, Santiago Meza Lopez was sentenced to 10 years in prison for charges related to organized crime. Despite the fact that liquefied remains are still being found every other month, and despite the fact that Santiago has not denied the heinous crime, he has not been charged for stewing the corpses. The reason for the delay is a mystery to many, but some people have their theories. The government has been implicated with the cartel several times in the past, and there are many who believe that some corrupt individuals within the government are protecting him. El Pozolero is due to be released this year after completing his 10-year sentence, and there is a lot of fear, especially from the families of his victims, that he will become a free man. All these families want is justice and the remains of their loved ones. It is unlikely that they will get the latter, but only time will tell if El Pozolero will answer for the terrible crimes he's committed. Look, man, bro did what he did, but look, I can see if the people was alive already. I understand about the remains part, but it ain't like he killed them. You feel me? They should be looking for, they should have been looking for the dude that's killing the people and bringing it to him. Like, yeah, fine, you can charge him for it, but... I don't even think he should have did 10 years. Was all he doing is disposing bodies, and they already dead. It ain't like they alive. Like I said, unless he done killed people that was alive, then it's a different story. But other than that, yeah, I don't think he should have uh, got ten years. I don't even think them people. I mean, they can be feeling some kind of way, feeling upset and hurt and shit. But again, he didn't murder any of them. 
unless they say he did, but we got proof that he did. Well, he know he, you know, but, I mean, smash that like and sub button, man. Shout out to the fugitive for this shit, man. And I'm out, man. Gang, gang.